This podcast is brought to you from our friends at Tincata Protective Fabrics, Emergency Networking, Magna Grip, and IFSTA. Okay, guys. Hey, Thank so you. welcome again to the uh, first two battalion chief. I'm Danny Sheridan. I'm battalion chief here in New York City Fire Department, and I am actually on duty right now. And with me, I have the esteemed Eric Petaway from Boston. You got a Boston hat on, Eric? No, uh, I can't uh, see. Dios los muertes. Okay. <laughs> it's, um, and I'm disappointed in the Red Sox. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and uh, Tony Carroll from. Uh, Forgive me, Tony. I forget the department again, but you are Washington D.C. Oh, there we go. <laughs> FDNY, we had, um, rescue one. We had uh, yeah. we had uh, Al Benjamin come down. Okay, and, uh, yep. he I did our 9/11 ceremony. Okay, and uh, gave me a shirt, so I'm repping it. Yeah, there you go. Love it. Yeah, I worked with Al. I covered in rescue one back in the day, back in the mid '90s. So anyway, so. I just got back from Ecuador. I was down there for a week, and I hadn't been there in a while. It's been like probably six years since I've been there. I think the last time I was in Guayaquil was a uh, was in 2017, and we did a RIT class. And so I was unsure of kind of what to do on this one. And uh, they wanted aerial ladders, so I brought down John Riker. I don't know if you guys know John from uh, from FDIC, and I brought down. Uh, Ricky Fernandez from uh, uh, Raphael. I'm sorry, Raphael Fernandez um, from Miami Dade and uh, a New York guy, uh, FDNY young guy, Kelvin. And uh, we started out with aerial ladders, but somehow we morphed it into transition transitional attack, mm. and uh, it went really well. And uh, you know, I don't know how to describe it, but um, you know, sometimes they'll show up with three guys three firefighters and uh, they don't have a choice. I mean, they'll, they'll show up with one truck and with two trucks and they won't have any help for a long time. And the buildings are concrete, which lends itself to, I don't, I don't know, uh, this transitional attack because <laughs> what they don't worry about, I think in Ecuador is because the buildings are so leaky. That's the term I'm going to use because it's so hot that the windows are, are not tight. The buildings aren't tight. The roofs have like a space, so they don't get that buildup like we get here in the states. You know, with this the R, the very high R value. So I put a lot of thought into it. And I said, you know, let's try it, and it really worked. I have to tell you, it looked worked really well. And uh, I showed them some techniques on from UL on how to use the nozzle, and I showed them the effects of using the nozzle to push push uh, the products of combustion. And bring in the good stuff as opposed to just using it, we call the four S's, right? And the four S's would be, of course, a solid stream, straight, very steep, and making a sprinkler. And for them, it just worked very well. So, so can, um, can you, can you, I mean, because that, I just, I cringe at that word transition. And, I know, and I, I know, I think, and you know, I know. I think that we should, we should worry about interior water or exterior water. And, and, yeah. And, yeah. and the transitioning thing, right? I mean, if I don't transition, we don't necessarily get off the rig and think, hey, let's go transition. No, let's go right. do exterior water so that then we can do interior water, right? So I All think right. that yeah. we just need to get rid of so, so how about the rest, of the, show, the rest of the show? We don't say transition. We say- That's fine by me. I, I don't know what else to call it. I know that I Googled it on YouTube. Yeah. And- Stockton and Cincinnati, all these videos that I found all use that term. Yeah. Um, in UL, I'm not sure. I think we did call it exterior water. In yes. Our UL. Yeah. Yeah. But, and that's, um, that, I was on that, that tech panel, right? For that, for the right. interior and exterior uh, hose streams. And right. um, yeah, and, and we're trying to rid the fire service of, of the word transition. And um, you Tony, know, that's fine. I, I have no like problem with that. Transition yeah. from um, officer to, or from a back step to, to the officer. You transition that, or you transition from, right. from, from, uh, um, from bargaining unit to non-bargaining unit. But fire, interior water, or exterior water. Good. That works for me. But what what doesn't change, and you have to do it correctly, right? If you're going to use it from the exterior, 
in order to not push those products, you have to do these, what we call the four S's. That's what we've been kind of preaching here in the FDNY. And ultimately what we're trying to do is make this kind of sprinkler effect. And if we keep it very steep and we use a smooth and we keep it straight, you're going to get this, this kind of uh, sprinkler effect. And it's just, I, and I, I was really hammering the point that this is not an extended operation. This is just to get us to, as we say, Baja the Temperatura, so it'd be lower the temperature, enough that, you know, with the two firefighters, you know, they can make entry a little bit safer, you know. And uh, that's a good you know, point. It's tough. But how long yeah. how long do you do it? Yeah. Um, and, and I think yeah, right, I, like I yeah. Yeah. I think one of the things that we are and Eric, you you two, we're we're the fire service are all visually based people, right? So if we get up there and we're going to do this, we should see a return on that, right? If we should see a reach, we should see a return on that within 10, 15 seconds, right? We should see that water doing something. If we don't, then you need to go find someplace else, right? You're not at the right place. So visual cue, right? Fifth, I mean, it doesn't take long because what are we using now? 160 gallons a minute. One quarter of that is 40 gallons, 40 gallons. 15 seconds that should do something right i mean but this is where i am i'm i'm out here in in exterior water land right because we got two guys on a rig two guys and and i I want them to engage right i want them to pull up as quack as fast as they can and have an impact and and maybe maybe it's safer to to remove the idlh than it is to go in and get them out of the idlh right so i think that uh, i'm in i'm in on it but you're right. You got to do it right. So, Eric, you and I could probably relate to this because we, we have about the same time. You know, when I came on the job initially, I worked in 17 truck. I was in a truck company and I carried the can for five years. Right. Mm-hmm. So which meant is I had that two and a half gallon water extinguisher with me. And, you know, we, we were quick. We pull up and, you know, I remember, you know, running up three or four flights of stairs and popping the door and crawling down the hallway with water can knocking down a room of fire. And I mean, that's only two, two gallons. I mean, I, I remember this guy, Billy Lawson. One time we had a job and it was out the windows and there was a big delay in water, right? It was 4th of July night. They were shooting bottle rockets into this apartment. And, uh, we got to the front door and he said, uh, I won't tell you the nickname he used, but he said, I got it. <laughs> and, uh, I went past him into the bedroom and he, he just knocked down the couch and the whatever the chair and enough that I was able to get past him Mm -hmm. to get to the back bedroom. And that was with two gallons of water. So like you're saying, Tony, right. With, with 40 gallons of water, hitting it and using it correctly, you got to do some damage. What's your thoughts, Eric? We haven't really chimed in yet. So. IFSTA is dedicated to updating firefighting techniques and safety through the creation of our manuals, apps, curriculum, resource one, and more. Our high quality, technically accurate, and affordable training and education materials have made us a worldwide leader of the fire service. Visit us at ifsta.org for more information. Uh, well, when I first came on, the old chiefs, where I worked, it was big line only, didn't matter. Uh, which, um, now that I'm a chief, my mentality towards that has modified a lot. But um, I, I have to agree with Tony, though. Like, I almost despise that term because I think it's something that's been done forever. And then somebody found the catchy buzzword to call it. Um, you know, uh, you pull up, maybe it, it's blowing out the windows right by the door. You just hit it real quick and go in. I, I don't think you need to call it a term. Um, And then I've had numerous arguments over it. It's just something about when people create this new term for something that's always been done, uh, maybe differently, like manpower dependent. You know, some places, maybe they got to do it for 30 seconds or a minute. Uh, but regardless, I, I, you know, I always say, if you don't see the white, there's something wrong, like, you start hitting something, you got a line somewhere and you still see the cucker, 
and you know that line's not doing anything really. So um, I personally believe in fast water, no matter what, and uh, we're pretty good at dumping in. You know, we'll do hydro to fire. That's generally a, a standard operating procedure, and at seven fifty a gallon tank, I mean, you might be able to put out a couple of rooms. Um, <laughs> uh, I don't know if you remember, we used to have these Fords, little four D ones. I think DC had some too, or maybe they look like oil trucks. We called them the oil trucks. Yeah, I remember those. Trucks. I sent some to Ecuador that looked like that. Yeah. So 500 gallon tank. Mm -hmm. And I seen some of the mold timers put a couple rooms out. Mm -hmm. And I, I, you know, I think balls and water put out fires and I will die, uh, you know, fall on the sword for that. Um, <clears throat> and I, I think, you know, manpower, you know, what type of structure it is. Like, see here, you know, we get rear porches a lot. Yeah. So when you pull up, it looks it looks like it's going to hell, but you'd be surprised with one straight tip hand line would put that fire out in thirty seconds to a minute. But that's and if it didn't get inside, right? that's an exterior, yeah. right? Yeah. And so what we'll do is the first engine will go. The job is supposed to get to the rear porches, so we don't have the extension. Yeah. But at that, the next two engines are going interior. So the way we do it on the rear porches is that first engine, that's it for them. That's kind of like their job is to stop extension to the exposures. So right. they usually get none of the fun. But that's based on two more engines coming right behind them. Can I can stop placing throughout the building and then go from there. Um, numerous fires I've seen where guys hit it with the deck gun for a quick 30 seconds. And then the guys, while the guys are stretching the line or something, I think what happens, and I wonder if any of you guys remember this, but a while, I want to say maybe a decade or more ago, there was all this talk of penciling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. And I was I like, well, what the hell is penciling? Yeah. And, and, but it was being taught as the new, the, like the latest and the greatest. Yeah. No, but it's like, out. Just put a lot of water on it, and then, you know, everything gets better. You know, I don't yeah. – so I, the term I don't like, but I do believe it's something every department has always done. Uh, I think I told you that time I rode with um, the closed engine in Spanish Harlem. Yeah. Brownstone, first floor kind of going. You know, they hit it from the steps and then went in, whereas yeah. now they would say, oh, they used a transitional attack. But I'm <laughs> saying, no, they used what worked for them. <laughs> yeah, and that style yeah. of construction. Right. I don't know if that right. makes any sense, but yeah, I know. Yeah. I mean, so uh, um, that definitely the penciling thing is it's horrible, and that's in textbooks, right? And that's the problem. Uh, yes, that's in textbooks, and you know what else is in textbooks is um, indirect attack, right? Where where that that stream is going up and it's and it's doing a ninety degree turn. But we know, right? But right? again, we know that it doesn't do a ninety degree. You have to do some other other maneuvers to get that water to disperse all over that room. I think one of the biggest things, one of the toughest things is who wants to be the company officer that says, hey, guys, let's go practice squirting water in a window. Right. That's tough. But you have to do it right. Just like every other thing that we do, you have to go practice that or else the guys won't do steep, um, straight. Right. And, and, and make it be like a sprinkler. They won't do it. Smooth, yeah. yeah. Like a trusted turnout jacket you've had for years, Flex 7 Outer Shell Fabric delivers a perfectly broken-in feel on the very first wear. Flexible, comfortable, and powered with the strength of enforced technology, Flex 7 Outer Shell Fabric is made to move. To learn more, visit tenkatafabrics.com slash flex Seven, Flex Seven, powered by Enforced Technology, only from Tenkata Protective Fabrics. 
So, yeah, yeah. you know, you, you mentioned, Eric, you make the penciling thing. And I, I think I know where two of this came from. And it's funny you should bring that up because I, I, I'm, I was teaching this new concept to these guys because I, I really felt they were ready for it and they really embraced it, you know. And um, anyway, they brought that up and they said, no, you know, you have to ch -ch -ch do this pencil thing. Uh -huh. And, you know, the only place pencils should be is right here on, this, on, the, <laughs> on the tip of a uh, – Yeah, you know, I agree. Right here. So, um, sadly, right, and this is my, this is how I think, this is how my mind works, right? So I always tell guys, and when I say guys, I mean firefighters, I mean both genders, but, um, what I think needs to happen is that you have to practice the way you play, right? And what I mean is I, I taught flash over for a lot of years, you know, up in Rockland County and, you know, we did that penciling thing because we're lazy because we don't want to reset the fire every time so we want to just keep it down <laughs> so it then it regrows again and then you know you don't have to you know reset the fire yep, every yep. time and you know so you know i've either done it with the can or i've done it with the line where you just ch -ch -ch. and sadly i was doing some research for something and i actually googled that uh i looked at a uh, an nfpa niosh report um and there was a fire somewhere in the midwest and they use that term in the fire where this group went in, they got caught in a flashover, and he penciled the line and succumbed, you know. And I tell you, I got caught in a few flashovers, but the one I remember the most was, uh, and we, you know, we didn't vent, we didn't vent properly or whatever it was, and we, we're in about two rooms deep, and you know we're hitting it but it was invented so the fire is coming back over our head next thing you know the fire is out it's out the front door and the room flashes like an explosion so i grabbed the nozzle fire fire and i said open that line keep it over our head and just like an umbrella you know and we just we huddled under it and i got on the radio i said you know politely i said take the windows um and you know once they took the windows everything was better you know but what saved our lives, and I, I, I could, I wish I was home. I would show you the helmet. I mean, I, my helmet was incinerated, and we were in a legitimate flashover. And what saved us is that we kept that line open fully over our heads, and uh, until we were able to rectify the ventilation problem. So, you know, but here's my thinking, right? So, if someone says, "Hey, the room's going to flash," it, and then you're you're used to doing this flashover training, and it's like, "Oh, it's a flashover," so let's Let's pencil it, you know, that's not going to work. It's not going to work because let me tell you something. Every fire you have a flash over, whether we're there or not, that's a different story. I mean, sometimes they flash way before we get there, right? And we all know the new fire loads and, and how things are flashing and whatnot. But, um, you know, when you're, when you get caught in that flash over, it's no joke. <laughs> it is no joke, man. And, uh, you know, you, are, your life is flashing before your eyes, man. And no pun intended. Like you, you know, you're just like, wow, this is it. It's over. So you really, like you said, Eric, you need as much water as you can in that line over your head because, and you know what I found too, from experience, I've been in four of them. If you're in a flashover, you can't panic. You can't panic. If you panic, you're dead. You just have to. You know, like you have to have that training, like, okay, just keep that line over our heads. And then we'll, I always tell guys, that's it. That's your safety net right there. Boom. Open it. So, but I think what we're doing with this exterior water is we're trying to cool it down. So, you know, it gives us an opportunity so it doesn't flash and we get in there and then we, we got a better shot at it. Right. What do you think about that, Tony? Yeah. No, I think that, uh, right. I, I, I don't want to say reset, but it definitely it definitely throws some water. And from my standpoint, right, it may bring it down to a point where it's safer for two guys now to make that entrance and, and go down there and get, get extinguishment. That's all right. Also, we know it, we know that it does good for the temperatures in the whole place, right? It, it helps with the temperatures in the whole, um, small house yeah. or building yeah. that we're going to. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. um, I, I, again, I think that, while while it's it's not it's not uh, you know making a push down a hallway, it may help it make it easier for us to make that push down a hallway. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, you know, it, it's it's got its benefits, and we know from from research, but we also know from our actual 
fire ground experience that it that it does good stuff. Breathing in diesel exhaust fumes is like walking into a fire without a mask. Over time, those toxins lead to cancer. Protect yourself with MagnaGrip the easiest, most reliable exhaust removal system that features a true 100% seal to eliminate diesel exhaust fumes. To get free grant assistance, visit magnagrip.com. Yeah. You know, you, water, water, water definitely changes. You know what Ralph did? Ralph Fernandez, he's from Miami. He's a, he's a lieutenant, you know, and uh, fluent Spanish speaker. And, you know, I gave him the portable ladders. I said, well, you know, I'll take the inside guys, you know, we had – John Riker doing the aerial and the towel ladder, and then Ralph was doing the uh, at the uh, ground ladders, you know. So I, I stepped outside, and I saw him taking a hook, and they inverted it, and they're pulling the line up. And what he did was, and I, I was just blown away. Now, again, we're talking about understaffed firefighting. We're talking about firefighting with, like, two or three firefighters, right? So he throws the portable ladder up. Firefighter climbs up. He takes his hook. He brings the, the nozzle up. He takes the the handle part, which I told guys never to use, but that the, that little pistol grip on the on the nozzle. He hooks it on the top rung. It's a perfect angle, and they opened it. It takes off all that back pressure, and instead of hitting it from the ground to the second floor, now you're hitting it from under the window, with, from the safety of the of the ladder. And I was like, wow. That was ingenious, you know, and uh, so we incorporated that into the drill. And I have to tell you, you know, I'm going to start using my mutual aid uh, social media again. I'm going to post some of these videos. Some, it was just amazing that how well all this this really worked, you know, with and just with just minimum, you know, manpower. Like they, their companies down there, they have two paid guys. They have a driver and a firefighter, and that's it. That's all they're getting. And mm. man, oh man, it it worked like clockwork, you know. So anyway, I'm a little jet that's lagged. I'm a little out of breath. That's a lot that they're trying. To- <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty cool that they're trying to do something with two guys, right? A lot of times you yeah. think they could just. Uh, well, I only got two guys. No, but you you can still do something. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I live in a I live in a small town upstate New York, and uh, you know, when I see the I've had in, I've been up there thirty three years, let's say, and any time I've ever seen a fire truck come into my development, it's usually just you can count on one hand how many how many firefighters show up, you know. And uh, we actually had a house fire within the last five or six years in my development, and uh, you know minimum manpower until, you know, until, until like 20 minutes later when all the troops show up, you know? So, yeah. Anyway. It's funny. I think with the manpower, cause, uh, uh, when I was kind of on Twitter, that's where my arrogance got the best of me because right. you're trying to have a conversation in 140 characters with somebody <laughs> and I can't like trying to, I'm like, listen, I get, 40 guys in five minutes. Yeah, me too. Yeah, same, you get, same in DC. Yeah. I, you know, I couldn't, yeah. um, right. I couldn't check my ego to go instead of telling him how to do it, realize that they got to do what's best for with their manpower and everything. It's kind of hard when you see those videos, you know, we all do it. What are they doing? What are they doing? And then you sit back and you see some of your own videos from your own department and you're like, Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Delete I'll, that I'll, one from the internet. <laughs> I'll tell you, it's a whole adjustment, right? And uh, and again, when I was when I was in DC, you could call a fire truck, and they would be there. A fire truck would show up in two minutes, right? With four guys, yeah, usually yeah. usually full of piss and vinegar, and they yeah, want to yeah, go to yeah. work, you know. And now, now I got um, it might be twenty minutes um, between firehouses. And, um, you know, that's that's with two people. And then, yeah. you know, if, if they happen to have like we have well, we have a three. I got three firehouses that are staffed. They got staffing for two people to ride a fire truck and two people on a medic unit. If they happen to be in the firehouse at the same time, then then we can take then they'll, they'll get off the medic unit and they'll get on the tanker 
or they'll get on. They have a, we have a couple ladder trucks, right? They'll get on those and they'll bring them. But now, right, you've already lost two guys because they're driving. And now we only have two people that can do anything. Um, so that, I shouldn't say do anything, but that, that initially starts to do the work, right? And so you have to employ some of these creative techniques to be able to do something. And, um, you know, we've been down, we've been down, we, we, uh, we had a, we, we were lucky to have a house that was donated and we couldn't burn it down, but we could go do some other stuff. So we actually took one of the walls out, put some plexiglass up. So now, you know, people can, can, can watch as we, we do some of this well, water mapping, if you will, and trying to see where the water goes and, um, buy some of these exterior tacks with, so we can do the right technique. So, I mean, it's made an impact. And I think also what's made an impact is just, you know, let's get to the scene. Most of our, almost everybody's got a thousand gallons. We have one that's got 2000 gallon engine, but we have one or two that's got 750, but they've all got water that they can do something. So get there. We'll worry about the, the tanker operation, but get there right away. Let's do a nursing with that second engine. That way we have a couple guys that can staff at a hand line and at least it starts to engage. Um, and, and it's made an impact. Well, let me ask you, other than manpower, what are some other like challenges you're finding now that you're on a smaller department? Seconds count when responding to an emergency. Minutes save count when documenting your day. Emergency networking makes records management easier and faster with its Fire and EMS solution. User-friendly, complete online and offline functionality, highly customizable, all at an affordable price. For more information, please visit emergencynetworking.com. Uh, I mean, I, I think that that's, that's really it, but it's the distance, right? The distance, the distance and, and the staffing. I mean, if we could get, we can get more people, you know how how beneficial, right? Again, like, and again, I was I'm a big I'm a big Mayday guy, right? I do a lot of Mayday training and things like that. I can't I don't have enough people to have a writ, right? I mean, I need these people to go. I need a, these people to go stretch a line, and then I need these guys to make sure we do an inter, do a um, do a search, right? So, but but fortunately, we've we've been staffing some more some more some more firehouses and. We have seen an impact where you look around and there's actually a couple guys here that we can go give an assignment to. And um, but it's, it's about people. It's about people. You know, creatively, somehow we got to we got to get, get some mutual aid here. We don't have an automatic dispatch, so we'll have to call. Right. And, and there's a, so there's a delay there. But uh, two more people makes it makes a huge impact on what we can do. Yeah, the decision making must be. Uh way different than what you came from. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I mean, and that's, that's what I think is too, is again, we, it's, it's funny when you talk about risk, right? You get 40 guys coming to a fire, you can pin your ears back, right? You can go, you can do crazy stuff when you know that there's 30 people out there, but, you, but you don't have that. That's real risk. <laughs> that's real. Uh, um, <laughs> which benefit and, and, and think that you do the right tactics when you only, when you're, when it's going to be 30 minutes for your next couple people. Yeah. I see sometimes that's why I find it. Uh, and I, I don't read about it as much as I used to, but how, um, there's certain national trends that then some places they try to force into their department when it's just sort of like, Hey, um, you don't have the manpower. You don't have the type of structure. I was way up almost in the Canadian border in New York. And I had no idea there's some kind of, like I was wondering why guys had bailout bags and it was all like ranches, a reservation and a casino. I was kind of like, and I don't know if that's true. Dan would have to uh, clarify that, but someone said it was like a law in New York state. You got to have a bailout system. I don't, but I'm, I don't know that. We all, we have them in FDNY. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I know I did some work with the IAFF uh, with their uh, fireground survival program. And, yes, it, in New York State, it was like a law that everybody had to – the department had to provide them. 
And it was something to do also with like, with over, if there was a population over a million, they had something that they had to do. But yeah, it was, it was a, a New York state required mandate, which is good, yeah, right? Good, But it's also like, well, well, maybe we should spend some money on something else. Put all that money, put all that money that we're going to spend on that escape <laughs> equipment and give me one more guy, right? <laughs> I tell you, there's a, when I moved out of t- the city, there's like where I lived, there's a town, then the city. And this is a rich town. And every time I see the ladder truck, I just chuckle because it's just one guy driving. Yeah. And, you know, I've talked to the chief there and he's like, well, uh, what do you call that? Um, the illusion of protection. <laughs> and he said, he said, luckily, though, I get two Boston companies, so I get the manpower. But I remember, you know, saying, I would just say, you know what? Put that guy on the engine. So now the engine's fully staffed. Would would be better in the long run than having one guy driving a million dollar truck by himself. So, and I think that's when you got to like check your ego or your arrogance. Like, <laughs> and uh, I was getting into too many arguments on social media over that. So I'm trying to be nice now. <laughs> Hey, let me ask you guys now what your thoughts on this is. I I think, um, see, in New York, here it is. Like, sometimes we have one size fits all, right? So I'm in the Bronx. And in my response area, I have one way is all private dwellings, right? Small, two, one, two and a half stories. If I go the other way, I have six story H types. So if the officer gives a 1075, that means it's a request for four engines, two trucks, a writ rescue squad and a little battalion chief and deputy. So I get the same amount of manpower for a little tiny house as I do as a large H type. And I can tell you, I just feel sometimes that almost everyone thinks it's such a great thing that you have all these firefighters showing up. I can tell you sometimes it is almost a curse to have 70 guys show up for a little tiny one bedroom fire in a two-and-a-half-story private dwelling because you know how firefighters are, right? Everyone has to get in, and everyone has to look in the room, and everyone's back, you know, and it's just like trying to, you know, then you got to keep these guys out, keep these guys out, you know, and um, I think it becomes a little bit of a, a safety issue because, you know, now you have to manage stairs. Now you have maybe lightweight construction. You have maybe – Trust is burnt out. You have more weight. You have water, hoses, firefighters in gear. Like each firefighter weighs probably 300 pounds. Multiply that by 10. Um, it can become a problem. It really can. And, you know, I, that's how I feel about it. You know, but on the flip side, I get a fire in a six-story H-type, and I get the fire on the top floor, and we have to stretch 20 lengths of hose. And I have yeah. maybe 200 occupants in a building. You know, so, you know, I think I, I wish sometimes and I know it's not possible, but I wish it could be almost like a we could have different codes for different buildings. I Like I wish <laughs> that the, the code for a private dwelling would be ramped down a little bit as opposed to maybe ramp up the, the H type or the or the taxpayer or the, you know, whatever, just kind of maybe <laughs> craft it a little better. Right. I mean, how do you guys work in uh, in uh, in D.C. and in Boston? I mean, do you? I know how you guys work in Boston because I know you get a full – if it's a, so you guys are different. You get a, a strike the box and you get a, a smoke showing or something, and then you get that whole writ and that whole thing, which I like. I'm not sure how D.C. works, though. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, okay. Uh, let me tread carefully here. <laughs> um, so uh, sometimes I do get like um, – when it's a smaller house and half the members there are giving you the puppy dog eyes because they all want to go in the building. But it's like, how many guys can I put in there? Guys, you win some, you lose some. And this isn't one you win. And then, you know, a larger building, a multiple, okay. And then when I first got out of headquarters, I was in uh, the country and I would get the same assignment like I was downtown to go to capes and ranches and I said how come we can't have modif- like a modified like 
instead of sending me and personally myself, oh, how do I do this? We used to get three, three, two, a rescue and the chief. And then we had a work and fire where we got an engine, a truck, a tower, a deputy, a safety chief. Then a second. I would, I would try to, um, like I, sort of like the all hands in between. But now I get more than I used to get for work and fire. And it's, and, and it's like, I just have no room for you guys. Like, I, I, how many people you got to stick in a building? And, and, you know, even the young guy, a lot of the young guys are in great shape. Nobody wants to come out and do rehab. You got to almost like grab the officer. Like you're coming out to get rehabbed. Everybody wants to stay in there. But if you're not paying attention, you, you get the guys who drift. Oh, chief, I'm just going to look at the, the D side. And then next, you know, you see them in the window on the third floor, like trying to work. So, I, yeah, I do wish we kind of, because we do have like different responses for high rise, subways, et cetera. But it seems like in every type of residential, we get the same thing all the time. But that's above my pay grade. So, I, I, I learned. I learned this trick from a deputy chief. I, I kind of learned how to, how to kind of massage that. But one thing I can't control is that if my first two engine or truck or whoever it is gets on scene first and they transmit the 1075 all hands, extra engine and truck, I have no control over that. But if they wait, if the dispatchers only give us three and two and I get there, then I have all the control. I could I could decide whether to ramp it up or ramp it down. Yeah. Because, you know, and think about it this way, honestly, and I've had this situation happen in the past, too. Let's just say I get a down here in Soundview, I get a, a 1075, I got a, a typical two, two-story two private dwelling, bedroom fire on the second floor, and someone gives a 1075, extra engine and truck. So now I have, it's a, it's, it's a remote part of the Bronx. I have five engines. I got three trucks plus a writ, that's four, rescue squad, chief, deputy. So I have all these resources now, and we have all these holes because it's so hard to, to get to this place. So now I have all yeah, these yeah, vacant yeah. firehouses. Now a, a really good job breaks out in that three-mile area, whatever it is, square mile. And I've had that. I've had that. I had a fire one time. I was kind of a new chief, actually. And, you know, the guy's like, hey, why don't you, you know, how come you didn't give the old hands? And what happened was it was just a bedroom fire. It was a three-story, whatever. It wasn't a big building, you know. And ironically, in the midst of that whole thing, another fire broke out just like 10 blocks away when all those units would have been been there. Been there but they were available to get to the real fire, <laughs> you know. So I think that's something that chiefs and officers have to consider is that, you know, like, it should be like, you know, what are my needs? Like, almost like a CANS report, you know, like, what, what do I really need, you know? And, you know, I'm not saying to be, like, a cowboy and say, well, we're only going to do two and two, like, you know, in the old days. But, you know, just to really think about, like, what am I really, what do I need here? I need, you know, one line. I need a backup line. I need a truck on the fire floor. I need a truck on the floor above. I don't need much more after that, you know? So really think about what you need like what do you think about that tone yeah i i think uh again i i've been retired for a couple of years from dc but but right before right before i left we had um an sog change a guideline change where um like we would send five engines two ladder trucks um a heavy rescue uh two battalion chiefs a medic unit and ambulance so that was like 41 people and again, it's uh, 33, it's 69 square miles. You got 33 firehouses. So, you know, they're all on top of each other. They're going to be there pretty quick. Um, because of that, right, we had some guideline changes after some from fire truck accidents where um, before, like, I could tell you exactly where all five u- engines were going, both trucks and the rescue squad, where they were all going to go. Well, the SOG change came up and said everybody stage except – the first and second new engine and the first new truck. So everybody else was supposed to stage a block away. And then the first arriving, and then to make it worse, the first arriving engine or first arriving unit was going to take command. 
right? Because I, I, it was great. We had battalion chiefs that had aides and really all they had, all they really needed, all they had to do was, was write stuff down and, and command the fire. But they wanted that first arriving engine to take command. So now it kind of, we threw that in there, which became uh, difficult for them to kind of understand exactly what, what was going on. But the beauty of it is, uh, you know, most of our fires are one line fires, right? Most of them are one line fire. And when, when all those five engines, when every, when the got, when the SOGs said everybody come in, you were fighting guys, right? You were having to beat them off and you had to worry about that. Well, now you don't have to worry, but you had to worry about where are you going to place units and that kind of thing. So, um, I, and, and I think guys started to see that, especially, you know, some of the, some of the, the quality officers are like, yeah, it's a one line fire. I can handle this. Right. All I need is a, I probably need the rescue squad because our trucks really weren't, weren't uh, given that search assignment. So um, they would come in and do, you know, ground ladders and forcible entry and support stuff, but they really, they really didn't have the search requirement, but you know, as a, uh, as this was going on and, and you had some good guys, they, they would, uh, they would know that they, that that's what needs to get done with the rescue squad staging. So it was good, especially when you had 40 guys going to a, a two-story detached or even a two-story row house. I mean, there's two-story row house. Obviously, you got some exposure, so you got you got some places to send guys. But you needed those forty guys on the high rise, or uh, you know, a, a bigger a bigger uh, apartment building. But you know, it was so it was it worked it worked to our advantage. But but you also um, you, know, you had to you had to kind of go practice with the guys so they knew what they could do now, what the expectations were, how to do command. You know, because they were cutting us out of the loop. I really liked the fact that we could command for the buggy, but then they kind of like, oh, the NFPA says first arriving unit. Uh, okay, whatever. I, I know this is Tony's wheelhouse with the writ, but um, one thing that I do with my my companies is um, I have a, uh, let's say you have a fire, right? And a three-story or two-story, something kind of smallish, you know? I don't mind. I, I Like, again, I and I tell the officer, you're my writ, and I and it's obviously what Boston does. I like Boston, that the way they do their whole thing with the, the chief and the, and the engine, the truck. In my mind, I already have a writ team if I need it. But what I will, when I have my fast truck or my writ truck, I tell the officer, you stay here at the command post. But if you want your guys to kind of dress up the building a little bit, like throw a portable up, maybe take some window bars down, but don't get too immersed in the operation. Like, don't go, like, you give them an, an inch, they'll take a mile, right? So you have to really kind of, like, you want them to do something, but you don't want them to disappear. And now you have a, a mayday, and now you don't have your, you know, your your red team. And I think there has to be that kind of balance. So, um, you know, like I said, I I'm, I know guys, no one wants that job. You know, let's face it. Like, no one <laughs> likes to be the guy standing there. Okay, I'm the red, you know. But if, if you have to engage them, you know, and I feel that if I give them an opportunity, maybe throw up the stick or put a portable up, or if I have window bars in the front, maybe just from the front. Now you're engaging them a little bit. Now they're, they're more involved in the operation and they're more, they're kind of more situationally aware, right? So I know Eric. I really do like, I'm not just blowing smoke, but I do like the way you guys operate. You have that engine, I think you have the truck, and you have the chief. Yeah. That's your RIT team. And I I don't it's, have um, that on paper, but I do that kind yeah. of up here, you know? Um, I have to like, not to, to that originally was my idea. Um, when I think I, when I was on the safety committee, spent a year researching RIT. And I, I said, I would look at other places. Like, you know, some places send an additional, like, b- battalion district chief that could, um, didn't have an assignment, but the initial chief could say, hey, could you do this? Could you do that? So then it, it's like, if you're going to take RIT serious, then you should take it serious. And something that I I, I do, I, I can't speak for all the guy chiefs, but if, a company is the writ, they're the writ. Like, uh, and only in a rare occasion would I say, 
grab a line instead. That would have to be like multiple buildings and I'm running out of people. Because it's like, yeah, you, maybe this fire, you only throw a couple ground ladders. Uh, you look at the building from the outside. But, you know, from experience in May days, um, you need people ready to go. And, and the members have to realize that even though they think they're not doing nothing, being in the bullpen is very important that you're ready to go. Um, and I think as time's going on, it's getting a little better. Um, I know I didn't like it when, when the old chiefs, they used to call them, they always had a standby company. <laughs> you always hated to be it, but it's so important. And, and one writ, I was the writ chief. And the, what ended up happening was the members inside got the member before the writ team got them. And we had just finished probably a year drilling on it, you know, every company group and all that. And the guys who taught it were really good. Uh, they still go on around the country teaching it. But when it's okay, guys, it's, you know, it's time to earn your check. And they were ready. And it was almost like how you drilled at the academy. And by the time I got in there, members inside had grabbed the two members. But I, I remember telling some of the younger kids, I go, see, that's why we do that. Um, you know, like, I don't know how, how, like, I don't know exactly how you guys do extra chiefs in uh, your department. Like, I like sometimes when people say, oh, you you're the senior chief and they got you as written. I'm like, yeah, well, it's still an important job. And uh, in fact, let the young guys get dirty. You know what I mean? <laughs> but. Yeah, that was one thing we had. We had, two, been, yeah. we had two chiefs on the box, right? But that second chief was typically going inside. He was going to go in and they would, you know, give him, um, a, a group, a division, whatever inside, uh, maybe exposures or something like that. But, um, yeah, it would be very rare. Uh, but I mean, again, knock on wood, right? We didn't have a lot of, a lot of writ in, uh, um, activations. So, um, we didn't, we didn't have an, an issue with that, but I could definitely see it's, it, I, I, we get a brand new promoted sergeant and he's going to be in charge of the writ. I don't know about that, right? We probably want a senior guy there. So, that might be one way to make sure it's a senior guy is having that chief there. But we also could add, you know, get a work and fire. You could add another chief, you know. Um, we had the two chiefs on the initial and not a chief on the work and fire. The work and fire would get you an engine and a truck, but not an additional chief. Yeah. You know, I, I can remember when I came on the job, you know, we didn't get rid until probably I was a lieutenant already. So it had to be. I want to say 95 or, or 96. I'm not sure. Cause I remember the first time I responded as the writ and the deputy looked at me, he says, he, he didn't even know what it was. He's like, I'm your, <laughs> I'm your fast truck. He's like, I don't know what that is, but um, it didn't sound good anyway. But, you know, I remember we had a few fires where we had firefighters go down. I remember one job in particular, we had a guy went off the roof and into a shaft and, and it, it it was a good fire, man. It was like, it was full of fire. It was rocking. I mean, it was like, it was an old tenement, railroad flats, you know. And I remember guys just dropping everything and just going. <laughs> it's like, you know, like now that, you know, we have a, we have a mayday and now we still have the whole top floor going and guys are like going after the, the guy in the, you know, in the shaft, you know, and, and that, that happened, a, that happened actually a few times, you know, and, uh, <laughs> there was just no, you know, the rescue, I guess, was supposed to be the, the writ, so to speak. You know, they were there to rescue if firefighters got in trouble. But what, I, what I've what i done in my mind with the, the, this whole writ thing, and I know, Tony, I'm not trying to steal your thunder. I know you do this May Day stuff. But uh, speaking from a battalion chief's perspective, you know, what I what I do in my mind is I um I keep – I have a rescue in the squad, you know, and uh, – I generally will use one of the whoever gets there first. I'll I'll give them an assignment. And I'll try to keep the other guy in my pocket. I have my fast truck. 
And I try to think about an engine company, you know, um, in case I need water or medical, you know, mm-hmm. you know, CFRD or medic stuff. And also what guys in my job don't realize, and, you know, it's not really well known, but we have in the New York City Fire Department, EMS, uh, we have on, just 10, 12 that, right? Um, we, Gas leak, okay. We'll check now. So what what we do is we have this uh, medics. They're called Haztac. They have the ability to wear bunker gear and air packs, and they can work in an IDLH. And not many chiefs call for them, you know. But that's something I have in my toolbox because if if I have a guy go down, I'll um, I want those guys, you know, if they want to, you know, let's say he smoked out or whatever, they want to be able to put in a line. I forget the name of the drug. I can't pronounce this. Car- Would you know, Tony, it's carby something, carby oxygen? The smoke inhalation stuff? Yeah, it's the drug that counteracts the, the, the smoke yeah. inhalation. Yeah. So that's another part of my kind of my tool bag, you know, that I have. So in my mind, even though I don't have them on paper, I have – like kind of like Boston, I have an engine, I have a fast truck, I have a rescue or a squad, and I have a Haztac. Wow. You know, or EMS. And then, you know, and I and I want to, you know, like if the, if I do get an EMS lieutenant or captain that does come to the command post, I will ask them, like, you know, we have a unit that has that, that drug, you know, so. And even for the civilians, actually, you know, if we get some... Uh, some civilians, some civilians smoked out. So uh, that's some crazy resources, man. You got an engine, a truck. You got a, a rescue. So you get a rescue and a squad on a on a, a N seventy five. Wow! Wow! Yeah. And you got you got you got you got one in five on an engine. Not on every engine, though, right? No, on the engine. Uh, depends on so, just a handful of engines. We have an officer, a chauffeur, and then four in the back step or three. Wow. The truck companies have a chauffeur, an officer, and four in the back step. And the rescues that have uh, an officer, yeah, so it's six, and the squad's the same way. So, yeah, we we have a, yeah, quite a bit of uh, resources. You yeah, guys on a rig in, in Boston? No. Well, officer, three firemen. Sometimes. You'll have a fourth. But like this time of the year, vacations, you know, probably from spring to late fall, this everyone's on vacation. So you're lucky to be one in three. But that's the minimum. Um, in three. Yeah, that's the minimum. And then a lot of times, say in early spring, you'll, be, you'll end up one in four. Uh, some deputies will keep the rescues and the towers one in five. That's the that that's the call they can make. Um, it's still it's 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 more than enough, and and, and I, I I just think fast water. The more people get water on the fire, everybody goes home. And um, one of the first chiefs I had, he used to always say, "Give the boys five to ten minutes with water." unless it's obvious. And his nickname was one builder, one alarm. But um, cause sometimes now I think, uh, especially with the way they, they um, teach a certain aspects, it's like, so uh, I don't know if you guys ever seen the video of like, we had a fire in Chinatown like 34, 35 years ago. So I was, you know, so I was working uh, first truck do. So when I hear someone now say heavy fire and it's like three windows, I'm like, dude, that's not heavy fire. Pulling up to seven floors of nothing but fire is heavy fire. But that, but then it turns out I realized they were teaching the younger officers certain terms. But I'm like, as soon as you use the term heavy, every ear picked up in the city and and depending on where in the city where we do get automatic mutual aid, even the surrounding towns are going, oh, heavy. <laughs> and, and it's like, um, I, 
chew gum or something so you can't, you know what I mean? Like, so you'll calm down before you hit that mic, you know? And I think we spoke I, about this last month. Yeah. I think we had this, this was our topic last month about creating yeah. a situational awareness. I have to be honest. I got, I, I've made mistakes in my career when I repeat something that's told to me and don't think about it. And I repeat verbatim what they say. And then I'm like, why did I say that? <laughs> you know, like someone just told me heavy fire. And I made that mistake. I have to admit, I just <clears throat> caught up and wasn't thinking. And even the deputy came over, he says, Danny, really? I'm like, I know, I know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't, I didn't mean it, you know, um, but um, yeah, it's, it's, it, it's important how we, how we talk on the radio, you, you know, one thing I do and I still do it. If uh, a day or two later, I'll go on that radio reference and listen to the archives. Cause uh, I'll, what you think you said sometimes and what you actually said are two different things. But I also do it because, you know, hey, why didn't I hear that officer calling me? Uh, like, uh, like you hear it in the audio, but when you try to put yourself back at the incident, you say, I never even heard him. Um, and, and at times we have tried um, a second radio for chief officers. It works good when you're outside but if you're the chief that goes inside having two radios is just not doable um so yeah I, i'm just uh it's funny but getting back to rick because i get distracted is um you know you, you just got to explain to people it's important be ready dissect the building i use them to throw ground ladders a lot too um, well, I think, don't you, know, you think that, uh, that, like you said, you had a, Danny, you talked earlier, or maybe it was Eric, I don't know, that, that you activated the Rick, but the people that were inside had already got the, got the members yeah, out. That was, and that's, that's kind of making sure you've got some re reinforcements on the fire floor, right? And um, that's where that, that backup crew or that second line needs to know. If they start to, if they got to engage and put water in the fire, then I need somebody else. You got to let me know that you're occupied, right? But if you're not occupied, then I'm going to use you as the writ on that floor, right? I mean, I think that's where, that's where our thinking needs to be now. The guys outside are great. But... Yeah, no, I know. I, I think, you know, and we'll finish up with this because I don't want, like I said, I don't want to steal Tony's thunder. I know that's his stuff. He's the May Day, but just I'm telling you from my own experience, uh, the last May Day that I had, I didn't even catch it because, again, talking about Eric, radio discipline, I had a, a firefighter who's now a lieutenant, which I, I can't wrap my head around, but anyway, um, give me some kind of crazy report, and I, I kind of got distracted because of his, whatever he was telling me, and a deputy came over, he says, Danny, he says, we have a May Day, and it was legit May Day because it was yeah. like... A wood frame. I couldn't see the front of the building. And you could hear, you know, and the vibe alert going off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I heard it again. And then it, it was like clockwork, though. I said, okay, Joe, you handle the May Day. I'll keep running the fire. And that was it. And then, like you said, Tony, I, oh, Eric, that um, what happened, the guy's working tonight that actually that got him. He, he just, uh, the guy got caught in a room. And a table or something covered the door, and he just kept going in circles, Good which just circles. happened to me. And one of the kids that was working went in, and I guess because whatever, he just like was able to, hey, cap, you know, and whatever, he was out. So, but anyway, uh, thank you guys. I know I'm at work and it's a little distracting, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going through something right now and it's very difficult. Um, you know, I'm coming towards the end of my career. Um, I got left on a deputies list. I was supposed to get promoted and they decided to kill the list and I'm, I got caught three names away. So, uh, I think uh, after 37 years, yeah, 37 years, uh, 62 years old, I'm going to, um, start thinking about something else. <laughs> it's very hard. Cause Go back I, 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 yeah, a chief, but a, a chief don't forget. Told me, no, go ahead. Time. Go ahead. Now, I was saying that a chief told me when I came on a job, he said, uh, how do I say this with 
you know, he said it's easier. He said it's easy to leave your wife than to leave the fire department. And I'm like 25 years old. I said I don't even have a girlfriend, you know. And I'm 37 years later. I'm thinking I saw him too because he was the commander here in the third battalion. I, he was the guy who I actually model my you know i always like used him as a mentor you know and i told him that and he's like we have the same locker we're both the commander of the third battalion and uh it's it's not easy it, it's not easy you know so uh you know i keep procrastinating i'm like all right well i'm gonna start thinking about it next month you know or, so anyway yeah yeah all right you make the right decision just a quick comment right Remember now, though, there's a whole generation of young captains making chief that could use your wisdom, you know? So keep doing what you're doing, just maybe not there. You know what I mean? Um, I find uh, the experience is leaving, no, no fault to anyone. And people should take advantage while you can. Um, so, like I said, you can see I have a beard. I've been off injured since the – that's why I couldn't make it last time. And I'm having, uh, I'm having like, the longer I'm home, the more I'm going. If I don't hurry back, I don't know if I want to go back. No, it's, I took the whole summer off. I was on the beach all summer and, uh, you know, already, you know, I've been down in South America. I got, like, more trips lined up. And, you know, you're talking about – preaching firefighting you know here's a place that hasn't hasn't heard anything so um anyway take it a day at a time all right i'm not gonna think, not gonna think about it yeah, don't, don't, but, don't yeah. be in a rush i'm not in a rush trust me believe me <laughs> i am not in a rush but uh kind of hurt though man to be you know and they're making acting chiefs all the time and i'm like i just don't even want to I, I can't even wrap my hand around. But this is, let me tell you something, though. All honesty, my father-in-law told me this. He was a battalion commander. He was of the 3-1 th battalion. And I always said, Pop, man, I said, how come you're not taking the deputies? Because all his friends were staff chiefs, and you know, he'd been through the war years. And he said, man, I love being a battalion chief. And uh, you guys both know. I mean, it is, it is, I have to tell you, firefight, they're all great jobs. I mean, it's, you know, you can't say there's any, one is, but it, it's a it's a very cool job being a battalion chief. So, yes, sir. Anyway, yeah. So, all right, guys. Well, thank you. All right. Uh, you can Thanks. see my breathing. My breathing is still a little a little <laughs> labored, so I can't catch my Have breath. Have a good meal and a good night. <laughs> all right, guys. Thanks again. Right. We'll thank see you. you. See you again, guys. <laughs>Flex 7 Outer Shell Fabric delivers a perfectly broken-in feel on the very first wear. Flexible, comfortable, and powered with the strength of enforced technology, Flex 7 Outer Shell Fabric is made to move. To learn more, visit TenkataFabrics.com slash Flex 7. Flex 7, powered by enforced technology. Only from Tenkata Protective Fabrics. Breathing in diesel exhaust fumes is like walking into a fire without a mask. Over time, those toxins lead to cancer. Protect yourself with MagnaGrip, the easiest, most reliable exhaust removal system that features a true 100% seal to eliminate diesel exhaust fumes. To get free grant assistance, visit MagnaGrip.com. Seconds count when responding to an emergency. Minutes save count when documenting your day. Emergency networking makes records management easier and faster with its Fire and EMS solution. User-friendly, complete online and offline functionality, highly customizable, all at an affordable price. For more information, please visit emergencynetworking.com.